Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Saturday afternoon studies, where we're going through a study of several different covenants that we can find in the Bible. We're using some material that was produced by Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, the founder and, and head of Ariel Ministries out of San Antonio, Texas. And as I've mentioned several times before in the work that he did, he recognizes eight different covenants that he finds in the Bible. And when I go through the study myself, I like to combine a couple of them that he keeps separate so that I end up with seven. They cover everything that he does, except I just combine what he calls the Abrahamic covenant with what he also calls the land covenant. And I combine those two together and we've already gone over those. In fact, we went over the Abrahamic covenant last Saturday. And today we're going to be looking at the Mosaic covenant. Remember that covenants can be divided into a couple of different ways. One is whether or not they are conditional or unconditional. A conditional covenant requires that mankind or with whomever God has made the covenant with to perform or to do or to obey certain uh, regulations or uh, instructions or conditions for the covenant to be fulfilled for mankind in a positive way. And if he does not uphold the conditions, then the covenant is broken and will either be changed or disregarded. Or that particular covenant may come to an end and a new one begin. And of the eight covenants that Dr. Fruchtenbaum recognizes, or the seven that I recognize, there are only two that are conditional. The rest of them are unconditional. Unconditional means there's nothing that man has to do to meet certain qualifications or conditions for the covenant to be fulfilled by God. He will fulfill them at some point in time. Some of them already fulfilled. Some of them are yet to be fulfilled. And the ones that even have been fulfilled if they're unconditional, will be ongoing for eternity. Today, as I said, we're going to look at the Mosaic Covenant. And it is conditional. It is related somewhat to the Abrahamic Covenant that we looked at last week because it involves the Jewish people and it involves the Promised Land and some other things concerning the nation of Israel. The other covenant that was conditional was the very first one that we went over. It's referred to as the Edenic covenant or the covenant made with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And the condition there was that they were not supposed to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they did that. So they broke the covenant and they were then deported out of the Garden of Eden and then there was a new covenant or a new dispensation that came into being. Remember that we also discussed that the covenants are not the same as a dispensation, but they are oftentimes associated with a particular dispensation. And a dispensation, we said, is not just a period of time, but it is normally designated or defined by or referred to as a period of time. But the dispensation itself basically is based upon what sometimes we refer to as house rules or rules of engagement or a particular set of instructions that God gives to mankind at that particular time or in that dispensation. And so we assign or we look at passages to support these different covenants that we talk about and the people with whom they're made and the conditions or not, the uh, provisions of the covenant, uh, the conditions of the covenant, the promises or the, uh, the consequences or curses if they're broken and so forth. So 
We also want to remember that the covenants can be divided as to whether or not they deal with mankind as a whole or the nation of Israel and the Jewish people. And you may remember that prior to the call of Abraham, we looked at three covenants, the Edenic covenant from Eden, the Adamic covenant with Adam and Eve and his descendants, and then the covenant made with Noah, the Noahic covenant. And those were all made with mankind in general, even though Adam was a representative mankind and Noah was a representative mankind. God was dealing with all people on the earth the same way at the same time. But with the call of Abraham, all of the covenants after that are made between God and the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. But you and I as Gentiles are said to be grafted in to that new covenant, which will be the last one that we look at and that will be two or three weeks down the road from now. So this particular covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, is a conditional one. It will be the last of the conditional covenants, there being only two conditional covenants. And it is the first one that is made, or the second one rather, that's made between God and the nation of Israel, the Abrahamic Covenant being the first one. Since the Mosaic Covenant began with Moses and is based upon the law of Moses, we'll go back to the 19th chapter of Exodus to see passages that support this covenant. This particular covenant is a little bit harder to identify a certain particular set of verses or chapters because it's pretty wide in its covering of all the things in it. In fact, we could include many passages from Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And in fact, I'll even read uh, a couple or three verses out of the book of Psalms that, has the, that refers to this uh, Mosaic Covenant. But first, I want to go back to Exodus chapter 19. Remember the Exodus talks about the time when God had Moses, and then Aaron helped him, lead the nation of Israel out of bondage in the nation of Egypt through the wilderness wanderings on their way to the promised land. So the exodus means a leaving or a, a leaving of the, the country of Egypt on their way to the promised land. And soon after they left Egypt, they end up at the base of Mount Sinai or sometimes in the Bible it's referred to as Mount Horeb, H-O-R-E-B. So I'll begin reading at verse one of Exodus chapter 19. In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, for they had departed from Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now sometimes the nation of Israel is referred to as the house of Jacob. Remember Jacob was Isaac's son, his second son. There were twins, Jacob and Esau. Esau sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob then had already been promised by God to his parents that the younger, uh, the older would serve the younger. And Esau was the older one, he came out first. Jacob was the younger one by just a few minutes. He came out second, but God had already ordained that he would be the one through whom the Abrahamic covenant and the line to the Messiah would go. And Jacob is the man whose name was changed to Israel. So his 12 sons became the head of the 12 tribes of Israel. So sometimes when we read here, 
the nation of Israel is referred to as the house of Jacob, and sometimes it's referred to as Israel. Verse 5 says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, so we begin to see the conditions that are going to be brought up when we see this word if. If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Moses came down and called for the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And then we come to verse 7 and 8 of Deuteronomy, or uh, uh, yeah, now we'll switch to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. For what great nation is there that God has so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason, we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all the law which I set before you this day? Moses, writing the first five books, referred to as the Torah, or the Pentateuch, meaning five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So Moses is the one writing this. Now I'm going to jump over to the book of Psalms and look at Psalm 147, verses 19 and 20. Again, the support the reason that we read this is that it supports the fact that this covenant, the Mosaic covenant and the Mosaic law is between God and the nation of Israel, not the Gentile nations. Psalm 147, 19 and 20 says, he declares his word to Jacob, referencing all of Israel, his statutes and his judgments to Israel. He has not dealt well thus with any nation and as for his judgments, they have not known them. So there's another reference to the fact that the law of Moses and the Mosaic covenant was made just with the nation of Israel and not the other Gentile nations of the world. Now I'm going to jump to the last book in the Old Testament and read one verse from the book of Malachi, chapter 4, verse 4. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb, the other name for Sinai, for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. So in the book of Exodus chapter 19, which is just prior to Moses receiving the 10 commandments in chapter 20, and then from Deuteronomy and Psalm 147 and Malachi chapter four, we read verses that support the teaching that the Mosaic Covenant was just between God and the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. So we'll follow what we did in the past in the previous covenants, looking at who the participants were, what the provisions were, and so forth. So we've seen here that the participants are God and the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. So now we'll look at the provisions of the covenant. The basis for the Mosaic Covenant was basically just the entire Mosaic Law, or the Law of Moses. <coughs> Excuse me. We might consider that it started with the Ten Commandments, but it came to include some 613 commandments in total that were recognized by the Jewish religious leaders. Many of them were directly focused on the priesthood and the priests, but there were a good number of them that were directed towards the rest of the populace of the nation of Israel, all of the other people, even beyond the priesthood. So the covenant was affirmed or agreed upon or sealed or finalized or however you want to word that by some words that we find in Exodus chapter number 24 the first 11 verses, and so I'll read those. 
Exodus 24, 1 through 11. Now God said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. Those are the two sons of Aaron at that particular time. And 70 of the elders of Israel and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came down and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it into basins, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said we will do, and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people ceremonially, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. That's a little bit reminiscent of what we find the writer of Hebrews talking about that first covenant that was being made obsolete by Jesus confirming the new covenant in his blood. And then in verses 9, 10, and 11 of Exodus 24, then Moses went up, also Aaron and his sons Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel. And they saw God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate, and they drank. So there were several things about the provisions of this covenant that we might point out or talk more about. First of all, it was based on the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, as I mentioned, 613 commandments. And Dr. Fruchtenbaum has noted that of those 613 commandments, 365 of them were negative type commandments. In other words, things thou shalt not do this or that. And then there were 248 that were positive commandments, things that they were to do or things that were to be done. The next thing is it involved blessings and judgments or cursings based on the condition. Blessings for obedience and judgment or cursing for disobedience. Next, there was a blood sacrifice that was added there already had been a blood sacrifice for the covering of sin because we can go all the way back to Abel offering an offering that involved a blood sacrifice that was accepted by God and Cain's offering did not include a blood sacrifice and God did not respect his offering. But from Leviticus chapter 17, verse number 11, it says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement or a covering for your souls for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul here again I might pause to point out the difference between atonement and the New Testament word that Christ became for us propitiation atonement means a covering and all of those animal sacrifices that were offered in the Old Testament under the Mosaic Law, under the Old Covenant, which is another way of saying the Mosaic Covenant, served as a covering. They didn't completely cleanse or take away their sins, but it covered their sins until Messiah would come. Thus, they had to be repeated over and over and over. But the Bible teaches us, especially in 
the epistles and the book of Hebrews, especially, that Jesus Christ offered himself once and for all for the final fulfillment of payment for the sin debt of mankind, if we will but trust in him and appropriate his payment for our sin debt by our placing our faith and trust in him as God's son and our savior. So here it says that the blood serves as an atonement for your souls because it's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. The next thing we might notice about some of the provisions of this Mosaic Covenant is that there were diet restrictions that were added. Remember before the flood, everything, man, beast, bird, everything, ate a vegetarian diet. After the flood, then I assume animals became carnivorous, some of them, and man was told that whatever moves is fair game for you to eat. Just don't eat the blood that's in it or no, don't drink the blood. And now we're going to see an additional change to the diet, what we might recognize as called a kosher diet. And that means that there were some stipulations of what they could and could not eat according to the Mosaic Law or Covenant. Animals or beasts, for example, had to have cloven feet, their hooves had to be cloven or split in two, and they had to chew the cud. So if there were any animals that didn't have both of those features, they were not to be eaten. That's why they were not supposed to eat pork. Even though pork has a cloven hoof, they do not chew the cud. And so they're considered to be unclean according to the kosher diet rules of the Mosaic Law. That changed after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and the new covenant came into being. And we find that change spoken about and taught by the Apostle Paul. But that's for a different time. Another thing that's changed, oh, I, I didn't finish. The, the fish that they ate had to have both scales and fins. So that means no catfish and uh, no crab legs or shrimp. Had to have scales and fins. And then the birds that they were allowed to eat were not uh, carrion birds or birds of prey or what we would refer to today as birds that eat roadkill. And so those were considered unclean birds but there were certain birds that they could eat. And then they were also allowed to eat a certain kind of locust as insects. D that doesn't sound too appealing to me. But remember that John the Baptist was said to have lived on locust and wild honey. But uh, I, I hope God gave him great blessings for that. I Even my crunchy peanut butter and honey sandwiches sound better than that. Another provision that was altered some was the death penalty had already been in, instituted after the flood by if anyone sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. But here we see there are some additional sins that are included that warrant capital punishment. And some of those were practicing idolatry, adultery, cursing God, even cursing parents, breaking the Sabbath, and practicing witchcraft. And there were others that we won't go into, but those were some significant ones that you would recognize. Then there was a token or a sign of the covenant. Remember the Abrahamic covenant had the sign of circumcision, and that still was part of the Mosaic law, but also they were to observe the Sabbath. And I have a tendency to agree with Dr. Fruchtenbaum in his interpretation that observing the Sabbath was not instituted at the time of creation, even though God rested on the seventh day. But I agree with Dr. Fruchtenbaum that observing the Sabbath for people to observe was part of the Mosaic Law 
and it came about with the giving of the Mosaic law and was meant just for the nation of Israel. And God did not hold other nations responsible to keep the Sabbaths or the law because the law was not given to them. Remember, this covenant was made between God and the nation of Israel. So we might also touch on the purposes of the Mosaic law in bringing this looking at the Mosaic law to a close. It was not meant to provide salvation. That's why the Apostle Paul goes to great lengths in several of his letters in the New Testament to point out to us that by the law, no one is justified. And by the law, no one receives salvation or forgiveness of sins by the law. The new covenant, based upon the shed blood of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and trusting in him is what brings about the new birth and salvation. And it is all by faith. Paul goes to great lengths to tell us that salvation is not by works, it's by faith. And my belief is in agreement again with Dr. Fruchtenbaum, anyone who has ever been a believer all the way back from Adam and Eve up to the present time has done so by faith by believing what God has told them. So there were applications to these Jewish people concerning the uh, purposes of this uh, Mosaic law. It was to reveal, reveal sin because Paul tells us in the New Testament that the law was like a tutor to us to teach us that we cannot keep it it would be possible, I suppose, in theory, if a person could keep the law perfectly and never sin, that they could walk right up into heaven. The only person that has ever successfully kept the law is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible teaches us that he kept it for us. We cannot keep it. So the law serves as a schoolmaster or a tutor, or a teacher to show us that we can't keep the law, therefore we need a savior. The law also reveals God's holiness. The law provides a rule of conduct for the Old Testament believers. And the law provided a way for the Jewish people as they would live according to the law to remain a separate and distinct people from the rest of the tribes or nationalities of people on the earth. Like what we read back in the fifth verse of the 19th chapter of Exodus, if they would be obedient to him, they would be God's peculiar people, a kingdom of priests for him. It also became the middle wall of separation, kind of related to that keeping the Jewish people separate and distinct from the rest of the world. And you may recall that the Apostle Paul spoke about a middle wall of separation in the temple area and the fact that that was taken down and removed in Jesus Christ. Because in the temple area, there would be a place where the Levites could go and a place where the priest could go. In fact, the priest would have access to every place in the temple courtyard area and in the temple itself. But no one but the priest were allowed into the temple itself or into the tabernacle prior to the temple being built. But in the courtyard area, there was a place where the Jewish men could go. There was a place where the Jewish women could go and no further. And then when there would be Gentile proselytes, people who were not Jews, but understood that the Jewish people had the words of the one true God, and they were the way by which they as Gentiles could access eternal life with the one true God. So they became Jewish proselytes. There was a certain place where the Gentiles could go and no further. And tradition says that there was a wall there, like a retaining wall 
a wall of separation that even had a sign, some traditional scholars say, that said that if you proceed any farther, you will do, do so at your own uh, responsibility because you could be put to death. And Paul said concerning this middle wall of separation in Ephesians chapter 2, for he himself, speaking of Christ, is our peace, who has made both one, meaning both Jew and Gentile, into one in Christ, and has broken down this middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, which is the Mosaic law, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both, Jew and Gentile, to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, the Gentiles, and to those who were near, the Jews. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So with the institution of the new covenant, by and through the blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, Jew and Gentile became one in Christ. And as the writer of Hebrews says, that when Christ brought in the new covenant, he made the old covenant obsolete. The old covenant is the Mosaic law, the Mosaic covenant, the conditional covenant and nobody could keep it. So it did not provide salvation. It showed us that we need a savior and salvation because we cannot keep it. In fact, even after we are born again spiritually into the family of God, as long as we're in our human flesh, we still will sin. We won't ever get beyond sinning and live without sin until we go to be with him and receive a glorified body. And so that's why we look forward to that. Paul even speaks about that in the fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians. So we've looked not at a whole bunch of passages or verses in a row about this Mosaic covenant because they're scattered all the way through from Exodus through Deuteronomy and even referred to as we saw in other books like the book of Psalms and the book of Micah. And there, the, the Mosaic Law is also referred to many times by the Apostle Paul when he's pointing out that that Mosaic Law and Mosaic Covenant has been made obsolete because of Christ and the New Covenant. Next week, we'll touch just briefly on what Dr. Fruchtenbaum refers to as the Land Covenant and point out and remind us again how that I have a tendency to include that into the Abrahamic covenant. And then we'll move on to the Davidic covenant. And we'll see how that there are some people in the church today that without even realizing it are fighting against the Davidic covenant. And the Davidic covenant is another one of those that is unconditional, which means we might find the beginning of it in 2 Samuel during the lifetime of David. But since it's unconditional, it will be in effect all throughout eternity. And so we'll discuss that next week. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for your word and the way that you reveal to us your plan and purpose for mankind. And we're so grateful that you had a plan even before the foundation of the world for the Lord Jesus to come and to pay for our sins by shedding his blood on the cross. Thank you for those who join us online. We pray you continue to bless them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hope that you have a good Lord's Day tomorrow and enjoy fellowshipping with other believers, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Lord bless you.